All right, so this is really exciting. So in 2.1, we went through and found the definite, found the limit using the definition of the, the limit definition of the derivative. Sorry about that. Um, to find an equation for the derivative, or if we wanted to find it at a specific point, we did that alternate form of the limit definition of the derivative. What you should have noticed, I'm sure we all did, is that it's a really long, sometimes torturous process. Like there's a lot of algebra involved, so it takes a really long time. Uh, this is exciting today because we find out there's a bunch of shortcuts you can use, right, to find derivatives. And so we don't have to always go through that super duper long process. So a couple things before we start, right, we talked a little bit about this, but it says the expression d dx means to differentiate with respect to x. Uh, the most common derivative is you take in d dx of y. That just means take the derivative of y. And it can be written that way as dy dx. Okay, here's our shortcut rules. The first one is the power rule. If I'm trying to take the derivative, and that's all that means, that says take the derivative of x to the n, our rule is you drop the power down in front, so we get that n down in front, x, and then you subtract one from the exponent. Here's a quick example you could write off to the side. If I had x to the third power, and I, I asked you to find the derivative of x to the third power, all I would do is drop the power down in front, 3x, and I subtract one from the power. So 3x squared. There's our derivative. Really simple and easy. Um, the constant rule says if c is a constant, if you take the derivative of a constant, it always equals 0. Uh, one example of that, and we, we did one like this. You had a f of x or y equals 3. Just think about that. That's a horizontal line. Well, if it's a horizontal line, the slope is always 0. It never changes. A uh, scalar multiple rule. If you have a function multiplied by a const, by a number, by a coefficient, then you can just leave the coefficient out in front. You can take the derivative of the function, find it right there, right? And then just times it by that constant. So it just stays out in front. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, look at that above problem. If I had 2x cubed, and I asked you to find the derivative, the three, what it, this, 2 is a scalar multiple. So 2 would just stay out in front. I take the derivative of x cubed, which is 3x squared, which did that up above, and now you can times them together. So we end up with 6x squared. So if you have that coefficient out in front, just leave the coefficient out in front, take the derivative of the function, and then you can multiply them together after. The sum rule. The sum rule just says that if you have two functions or two parts, two terms that are added, it could be subtracted also because subtracting is really adding a negative. You can take it and break it into pieces and do it one at a time. So I could take the derivative of the first piece, f of x. Then I could take the derivative of the second piece, g of x. And, and that works. So let me give you an example. If I have this function, y equals uh, 2x to the fourth plus 3x plus 5. Let's do a minus in there. Let's change that 3x to a minus. If I ask you to find the derivative, well, we can apply all these rules. The 2 is a scalar multiple, so I can leave it out in front. I take the derivative of x to the fourth. This is the power rule, the first one we did, 4x to the third. So I end up with 8x to the third. Um, this is a little tricky. There's a 1 there, right? So it's minus 3 times, drop the 1 down, times x, and subtract 1 from the power. Well, hey, 3 times 1 is 3, and x to the 0 is also 1. So you have 3 times 1 times 1. That just comes out to be 3. Take the derivative of 5 now. Hey, the derivative of 5, it's a constant up here, right? Derivative of a constant always equals 0, so there's like a plus 0 there. So really your derivative is just 8x cubed minus 3. That's a whole lot faster than going through that big, long process of using the limit definition of the derivative. So here's some examples. If you start with number 1, if I want to find the derivative of x to the 4th, just drop the power down, subtract 1 from the, from the power, 4x to the 3rd. Uh, number two, similar, you drop the power down, negative two-thirds x. Now this is a tricky part, is I have to go subtract one from the, from the power. Well, if I subtract one from negative two-thirds, I'm going to subtract, one's the same as three over three. So negative two minus three would be negative five over three. Okay, and then i got to take the derivative of, of three. Well, it's a constant, so it just goes away. So I'm done. Hey, on number three, 
you can you cannot apply the power rule as it is right now. So sometimes you have to change the equation or manipulate it a little bit before you can. So I'm going to take that t to the, the 3 and move it up to the top. So it would be 1 half t to the negative 3. So it looks like that. So I just took that t to the third, moved it up. Now I just have something times t to a power. Now we can apply the power rule. So I'm going to go 1 half times negative 3 times t. And I have to make sure you subtract 1 from 3. So negative 3 minus 1 is a negative 4. Uh, let's simplify it a little bit. 1 half times a negative 3 would be a negative 3 halves. You can leave the t to the negative 4, or if you want to, you can even move it down below. Move it back down to the bottom and make it positive. Either one of those two answers is fine. So sometimes you have to manipulate the equation first before you can ap apply the power rule. Remember, for the power rule to apply, it has to be something times x to a power. So 4, we got a problem too. So on 4, Let's take the 2x, let's multiply out the 2x cubed. So I have to cube the 2 and cube the x. And now kind of like the last problem, I'm going to take the x to the third and move it up to the top. So it comes out to be 5 eighths x to the negative 3. Okay, now I can take the derivative. So f prime of x, got a dead spot right there, that is equal to uh, 5 eighths times by negative 3 times by x, and I have to subtract 1 from the power, so x to the negative 4. Okay, now let's simplify that. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. So we can draw, let's see, it would be negative 15 over 8, x to the negative 4. And if you want to move that x to the negative 4 down to the bottom, you could. But that, that's what f prime of x is equal to. All right, so higher order derivatives, right? When you take the derivative of a, of a function, you get another function. So we can actually repeat that process, a differentiation process. So if I find the first derivative, I could take the derivative of that, and it would give me the second derivatives. Um, so we call these higher order derivatives. And this is just a notation thing, right? The first derivative is y prime with the one little tick mark. If I do that second derivative, I just put two of them there. The third has three. Sometimes you'll see it written this way, y, and it'll have a little four up there. That just means the fourth derivative. They didn't want to make four tick marks. Same thing with the f of x. We could have f prime of x, first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative. Uh, we talked about how dy dx, that means to take the derivative. So if it says d squared dx squared of y, that is means take the deri second derivative of y. We don't square the y because the y is the name of the equation. So that's saying the second derivative of y. This is saying the third derivative of y, and so on. Uh, same thing over here with f of x, right? There's my first derivative. d squared dx squared just means take the second derivative. That means take the third. So these are really just notations. They all mean the same thing. You just have to be able to recognize that notation and, and be familiar with it. Uh, so here's an example. It says f of x equals 1 over 2 cube root of x squared. It wants me to find f prime of 1 the first derivative when x equals 1, and f double prime of negative 8. That just means the sec second derivative when x equals negative 8. So let's start. Let's find the first derivative. Then I'll have to plug 1 in. So to, I'm first going to rewrite that. So f of x, I'm going to rewrite as being 1 half. Cube root of x squared is x to the 2 thirds. It's supposed to be on the bottom of the fraction there. But to use my rule, I'm going to have to move it up to the top. So I end up with this, 1 half x to the negative 2 thirds. Okay, that's what f of x equals. Let's find the derivative then. So let's find f prime of x. So the 1 half stays in front. Drop the negative 2 thirds down. x, and I subtract 1 from the power. So I have to go negative 2 thirds. Oops, sorry about that. I have to go negative 2 thirds minus 1. That'd be minus 3 over 3. So you end up with negative 5 thirds. Uh, let's do a little bit of simplifying. So f prime of x is equal to, uh, those twos just cancel, so negative one-third uh, x to the negative five-thirds. Okay, now it wants me to find f prime of one. So I've got to plug one in there. Negative one-third times one to the negative five-thirds. Hey, one to any power is one. 
So even though it's a negative 5 thirds, it's still equal to 1. 1 times negative 1 thirds is negative 1 third. All right, let's find the second derivative. So let's do f double prime. All right, so I got negative 1 third. Drop the negative 5 thirds down in front. And then x to then subtract 1. So I have to go negative 5 thirds minus 1. So it's negative 5 thirds minus 3 thirds is negative 8 thirds. Okay, we got a little cleaning up to do. So the second derivative equals times those together is a positive 5 ninths x to the negative 8 thirds. I'm going to move that down to the bottom. 5 ninths x to the 8 thirds. And then I've got to plug 8 in there, right? It wants me to find the second derivative when x equals negative 8. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, change that to a radical. I'm going to write it as being 5 over 9 cubed root of x to the 8th. And you can put the 8 on the inside or the outside. I'm going to put it on the outside. So I just rewrote it as a radical. Okay, now I've got to plug 8 in there. Or uh, negative 8, excuse me. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Then I have to go negative 2 to the 8th power. That would be negative 2 times negative 2 8 times. I think it comes out to be 256. So it comes out to be 5 over 9 times 256. Uh, and now you can times the 9 and the 256 together if you want to, or you can leave the answer like that. We have to kind of get used to, in, in AP Calc a lot, instead of having these nice numbers, like most time in math, in textbooks, you're given these nice equations or nice numbers that work out nice and even. A lot of times on the AP test, they don't. And so to model that, you'll see in the book a lot, you'll get answers that are fractions, sometimes like crazy fractions like this one. Uh, don't feel like you've done something wrong. Like that, that's normal. Um, so don't, don't let that bother you. Okay. Equations of a tangent line. So when you have a, the derivative gives you the slope of a, the tangent line of the graph of a function. So because of that, you can use a derivative to find the, the tangent lines. So if you're trying to find the equation of the line, remember there were two formulas. We had y equals mx plus b to find the equation of the line. We also had point slope. Sorry, that's supposed to be an x one there. Well, this one works great as long as you know the y-intercept. We'll almost never know the y-intercept. So in general, we're not going to use the y equals mx plus b. We're going to use the point slope. The y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So that, that's the one we're going to use right here to find the equation of the line. Well, to do that, I need two things. I need to know the slope, and I need to know a point. Well, so just, thinking of, just thinking of a curve, if I'm trying to find the equation of a tangent line, let's say I have a point right there. We know a tangent line touches at one point. So if I know the point, that's what I'm going to plug in for x1 and y1 right there. But I have to know the slope. Well, the way we find the slope is what we've been talking about. That's taking the derivative. So we'll put this all together and do a problem here in just a second. Before we do, just another vocabulary word. So sometimes we want to find a line perpendicular to the tangent line at the point of tangency. So if I draw this picture, this is a tangent line. If we find what's called the normal line, it's the line at that point that's perpendicular to it. So it's that line right there. So just know that normal line means the line that's perpendicular to the tangent line at that point. Well, we know with perpendicular lines, the slopes are opposite reciprocals. So if I, know that if I can use a derivative and find the equation of the tangent line, I can take the opposite reciprocal, and I can find the equation of the normal line that way. So let's do this example. It says, find an equation of a line tangent to the graph of that function at the point 1, 6. Hey, first of all, if we're finding the equation of a line. As soon as you hear that, you ought to be putting this down on your paper. That's, that's our formula, right? Point slope is how we're going to find the equation of the line. Well, I need to know the slope and, the, and a point. Well, I've got a point right there. So there's my x1 and my y1, 1 and 6. I'm going to plug those in. But I've got to know the slope also. Well, to find the slope, that's the derivative. The derivative gives you the slope at that point. So let's find the derivative. Let's find f prime of x. So 4 times, drop the 5 down. So 4 times 5 would be 20, x to the 4th, minus, drop the 2 down. 3 times 2 is 6, 
x to the first, and the derivative of 5 is 0, so it goes away. What I want to find is a derivative at this point when x is 1. So I'm going to plug a 1 in here. That would be 20 times 1 minus 6 times 1, so we end up with 14. That's my slope. That is a slope of the tangent line when x equals 1. Okay. So I'm going to come over here. Let's plug everything in my formula. I get y minus my y coordinate, which is 6, equals my slope, which is 14, times x minus my x coordinate. There's the equation of my line. We could also put that in a different form if we wanted. Like you could times 3 by the 14 and add the 6 to put it in slope-intercept form. Or we could put it in general form. We could do either one. Okay, 7. Find the equation of the normal line to the same curve. Same curve, so it's this, still this, at the same point. Okay, so my point is still 1, 6. And so if it's the same curve, it has the same slope. So the slope of that point we know is 14. But because we're doing the normal line, that means the line perpendicular to it, I've got to do the opposite reciprocal. So my slope would be, take the 14, flip it over, and change the sign. Okay, plug in your formula. y minus my y coordinate equals the slope times x minus my x coordinate. There's the equation of my normal line. Okay, so tangent line has the same slope. Normal line has the opposite reciprocal. Um, make sure you know the point, use the point slope formula. To find the slope, you've got to take the derivative and plug in your x value at that point. Let's talk about this real quick. Sometimes functions ha don't have derivatives. That's what we're going to talk about right now is when they do or when they don't. So all of these examples, these pictures, don't have a derivative when x equals 1. This one has an open point. Well, remember, the derivative tells you the slope of the curve of the tangent line at that point. If there's not a point there, you can't have a tangent line. So it should make sense that it does not have a derivative. If there's a jump, same thing. You can't draw a tangent line. Like there's, there, so there, there is no slope at 1. Uh, if there's a vertical asymptote, again, the graph doesn't even exist at 1. So you can't have a tangent line. So those three are all, all go together. If you want to I don't know, put a big box around them. Those are all discontinuities. If there's a discontinuity, then it does not have a derivative at that point where the discontinuity happens. Besides the discontinuities, there's two other ones you have to watch for. One is a sharp turn. That point right there does not have slope. Like if you try drawing a tangent line, there would actually be an infinite amount. You could draw an infinite amount of lines that touch that point. They're all over the place. Uh, so if there's a sharp turn, there's no derivative. There is no slope at that point. The last one is a vertical tangent. If it comes in like this, at that point, it has a vertical tangent line. That means that it does not have a derivative also. So to kind of summarize that, really there's, two, there's three things you have to worry about. Let me slide all this stuff out of the way. Uh, the first one is discontinuities. So they broke them up here, but it doesn't really matter. As long as it's a discontinuity, whether it's a whole jump or vertical asymptote, that means that it does not have a derivative. The other things you have to worry about are sharp turns and vertical tangent lines. So if you're asked to check that, that, that's what you're looking at. That's what it says down here, right? If a function is not continuous, it's not differentiable. So whether it's a whole jump, vertical asymptote. A function also can't be if it has a sharp turn or a vertical asymptote. So this next part just asks us to go through and um, find out if these functions are, like, it says, what are the x values when they're not differentiable? Well, absolute value, we know what the graph looks like. It's a V. Well, it's got a sharp turn then. So at x equals 0, it's not differentiable. Uh, it says give a reason. My reason would be sharp turn. Okay, The trickiest ones, I think, are piecewise functions. Because piecewise functions, you have to worry about two things. Let me draw a quick picture. It could be like this, where there's a parabola and then a jump, you know, something like this. Well, we know at a jump, it's not differentiable. The other thing is you could have a parabola that goes to here, and then a line that takes off, and there's a sharp turn, you know, right there at that point. So the two things you've got to worry about is, is it continuous, first of all? And if it is, is it differentiable? So let's look at number nine. This part is continuous. That's a parabola. This part's a line. It's continuous. But the question is, what happens when they meet? So first of all, plug zero in. When I plug zero in here, I get zero. When I plug zero in here, I get zero. 
that means they meet at the same point. Like they both meet at zero, zero, right there. The question now, like we got a parabola, and then we got a line with the slope of one. The question now is, is it a, is it a sharp turn? It's hard to tell by looking at the, just by trying to graph it. So there's a way you can tell, and the way you tell is find the derivative. When you find the derivative of a piecewise function, you have to find the derivative of both pieces. So this would be derivative of x squared would be 2x, derivative of x would be 1. And then I want to find out, at that point 0, do they have the same slope? If they have the same slope, then it will be a smooth curve. There will not be a sharp turn. If they have different slopes, it's a sharp turn. So all I do is plug, I'm, I'm worried about at the point when x equals 0, right? When x equals 0. So plug 0 into both of them. This one has a slope of 0. This one has a slope of 1. Well, they don't have the same slope. That means sharp turn. So number 9, we're going to say uh, when x equals 0, it's not differentiable. And my reason is that it has a sharp turn. Okay, look at 10. f of x equals x squared. f of x equals x squared plus 1. Uh, and it's getting piecewise. If I plug 0 into both of those, this one comes out to be 0, this one comes out to be 1. That means that there's a jump. It's not continuous. So this would be not differentiable at x equals 0, and the reason would be a, because of a jump. That one looks like this, right? It comes down like this. The other one starts up here at 1 and goes up there like that. There's a jump. Uh, 11. On this one, we've got some discontinuities. We know that x cannot equal 0, right, because of that. And x cannot equal 1. That's my domain. You could check if x reduces. So we know that means that 0 is a hole in the graph. Uh, the x minus 1 does not. That means that it's a vertical asymptote. It doesn't really matter, though, because as long as it's a discontinuity, whether it's a hole or a vertical asymptote or a jump, then that means that it's not differentiable. So on this one, we'd say it's not differentiable at 0 and 1 because there's discontinuities. The okay, last one is 12. If you remember what this one looks like, this is one of those parent graphs that we memorized. It comes in like this, curves up through there, and then goes out like that. Well, at this point right here at 0, it's going to have a vertical tangent line. So 12, we'd say no, and the reason why, it, it, sorry, we would say at x equals 0, it's not differentiable, and the reason why is because it has a vertical tangent line. All right, last thing. We talked about average rate of change in the last chapter, and we know how to find that, right? We call it AROC. And the way we find that is we just take y2 minus y1 over x2. We take the two points and find the slope. That's like this, right? You got a curve. If you pick two points, find, use a slope formula to find the slope of that line right there. That gives you the average rate of change, right? y minus y over x minus x. Um, now, because we, we're doing calculus, we know how to differentiate, we can actually find the instantaneous rate of change, right? So this is the slope at a single point. So now, if I come back up here, if I want to find the slope of this point right here, I could actually find that exact slope using the derivative, okay? So down here, if I want to find the, the instantaneous rate of change, which abbreviated as IROC, we take the derivative and plug in our value. So let's do these two examples so you can see this. 13 says f of x equals x cubed plus 2x. Uh, find the average rate of change. So to find the average rate of change, I have to use my two points. So I'm going to plug, I need to find my y coordinate. So I'm going to plug 10 in. 10 cubed plus 2 times 10, that's 1,000 plus 20. So that's 1,020. I'll plug 30 in. 30 cubed is 27,000. 2 times 30 is 60, so I should have left myself more room here. It would be 27,060. Okay. Well, I'll, this is average rate of change. Average rate of change. This is just slope. So I go 27,060 minus 1020 divided by 30 minus 10. And you'd work that out. You know, 26,040 divided by 20. And you could keep going from there and simplify it. So that's average rate of change. We did that in the last chapter. The cool thing now is we can actually find the instantaneous rate of change. So at that exact moment, we can find out what it is. So whenever you hear instantaneous rate of change, we have to know it means derivative. Okay, derivative is the, is the slope or the instant rate of change. So I'm going to take the derivative. f prime of x equals 3x squared 
Uh, hey, that 2x to the first, right, the 1 drops down. 2 times 1 times x to the 0. x to the 0 is 1, so we just end up with 2. Whenever your degree is 1, the, x, the variable basically just drops off. Okay, so we want to find f prime of 10, though. That will give me the instantaneous rate of change at 10. So if I plug 10 in, 10 squared is 100, times 3 is 300, plus 2. So the instantaneous rate of change at 10 is 302. So again, you're just comparing those. You have average rate of change, right? Use our slope formula. That's, just think back, that's the way you've been doing it forever algebraically with the two points. Instantaneous rate of change, you have to use calculus. So you've got to be able to uh, take the derivative, plug your number in, it'll tell you the slope of that exact, uh, that exact point. Okay, that's it for the material for this. So uh, work hard on it, and good luck.